The church needs to readopt this innovative spirit that Paul had to leverage technology for the gospel. This is what I believe. We don't need to do that because of COVID in the world. We need to do that because of indifference in the world. What we need to do as church leaders is to start to leverage the reality of the world and start finding ways to create calls to action for every piece of content that we put out that leads people into physical community. guys, this is Frank with Tithely coming to you with another episode of Modern Church Leader. Uh, man, excited for today, as I am with pretty much every episode. I love talking to church leaders and pastors and people in this world making a difference. And today I'm joined in the morning all the way from Australia, uh, Mr. Dave Adamson. What's going on, man? Hey, man, how are you? Uh, I'm, I'm amazing. Like oh, I'm life, so glad to hear good. that. Yeah. Life is good. I can't complain. I got three beautiful boys and an amazing wife and a great career. And I live in a beautiful place. I mean, look, there's, it's all good. <laughs> I concur with everything that you've just said, except I have three beautiful girls. So everything else is very similar. Dangerous. I don't even, we don't, I don't know if we want to have that conversation recorded, um, but <laughs> I don't know what it would be like to have three girls. Well, I do they have say, one, of, one of my great friends has three girls and he's managed his way through it. So, yeah, sure well, they say that the first 40 years of parenting are the hardest. So, you know, that's I'm just living in that reality and yeah. trying to get through it all. My, so I have, as listeners know, I have triplet 10 year old boys. You got 30 years to go. I, I have a long time. So where, where are you at? How old are yours? Uh, my girls are not triplets. They are 18, 19 and 21. Okay. Um, I mean, so, you're working on getting out of high school into college. Yeah. Two of them are in college already. One of them is a senior. And, uh, you know, the school year in Australia is January to uh, December, essentially. Mm -hmm. So she's got a, about half the year to go when, at the time of recording this. So, yeah, I'm, we're getting into that almost, almost empty nest phase, which is great because my wife and I still really like each other. And we're really looking forward to it. So, Amen for that. I, I hear you. <laughs> I mean, it's all good. We get to, we get to celebrate not even then, like if the kids are at a sporting event or something like we're usually there. So I, like, we're just always with them. There's no, yeah, no, we did go, we did go. We have some great, you know, friends that babysat for the, for us, watch the kids. We took a long weekend and we went to Nashville and we went to go see a Bon Jovi concert. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. This is like a month ago. <laughs> Bro, there is literally um, everybody who knows me knows that I am about the biggest Bon Jovi fan on the planet. No, you're not. <laughs> uh, 100%. I've seen them maybe seven times in concert. Oh, my God. I even bluffed my way into a press conference one time to interview them all. <laughs> no, you didn't. And and as I outline in one of the chapters in my book, this story, I even had a guitar lesson with Richie Sambora. No way. Well, hold and on, dude. Like we were. This is where I mean, you can't see it well, but Bon Jovi <laughs> concert. Hold on. Let's see if I have. Like we were, we were right there. We had pretty good seats. Dang, dude. They're really good seats. Yeah. Yeah. We were close. We were like right up on the edge. <laughs> Um, but that, you know, I've had a guitar lesson with Richie Sambora. So is, is Richie like the long dark hair? Yeah. Yeah. The original okay. guitarist. He was on our side. So we were kind of like on a corner, right? Yeah. So he was the guitarist on our side. And I can even tell you, then you, you were left of stage. Cause that's where he always stands. We, he was rocking out like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so good. And the drummer, the drummer's just an animal. Like all of them. Chico was, Torres. Just the human metronome. Yeah. You're talking to the right person. You know way more than I do. I enjoy the music. I don't know any of their names, <laughs> but they rocked it out. They did all the classics of which, you know, like I, I enjoy them. I, I, you know, I probably know five or six of their songs. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know like the real uh, hits, like the real. You, you didn't deserve to be that close to the stage. I know, man. I know. It's... <laughs> 
<laughs> that's usually reserved for, you know, super fans, the people yeah. who have visited, who when he lived in New Jersey, visited the the house that John Bon Jovi grew up in in Sayreville, New Jersey, no to way. get a photo out the front of it. That's how nuts I, I have just in in so the what opening are you, are you like this, are you, you 45 43 where, i where just are, turned 50 you just turned 50 okay just so turned classic 50. yeah my wife so i'm 44 my wife is the same age she's the huge bon jovi fan like she's the one that got us to bon jovi and i had a great time but like you know she knows more of the music and got the t-shirt and all the things um, brilliant i think wow. in the first opening minutes of this podcast I've just proven that maybe I'm not a modern church leader. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not as relevant as I like to. Twenty think to that fifty, I am. like you're. Maybe you're right on the edge. Maybe you're just. <laughs> um, that is well, or you've you've uh, revealed something about yourself that most people don't know, and they've they've heard it here well, first. I did. I it's it's the opening to chapter eleven in my book uh, where I talk about. Um, preaching like a YouTuber. I, I don't know. I don't know if you even talked about my book. I've got a new book out. Uh, That's Frank, what, well, I don't know if you're aware. Well, um, I but, think it has something to do with like the metaverse and correct. You know, and so in, chap in chapter 11, I talk about uh, preaching like a YouTuber and how my concept of preaching had changed. Um, and, and I, I open up the book. Uh, sorry. I open up that chapter with a story about how I played guitar with Richie Sambora one time. And, um, you know, he was, it was in a, in a, I'd won a competition. It was, uh, it was me and a couple of other people. And he wanted to assess what our skills were like. Cause normally people who come to those things who win the competition can't play guitar, which of the three of us, two of them couldn't, I actually could. And so, you know, um, Richie Sambora says, Hey, just play something for me. So I, I can sort of assess where you're at. And me, like not even thinking, just starts playing the opening riff of Wanted Dead or Alive, like just the classic Bon Jovi song <laughs> yes. for which Richie Sambora himself wrote the lick. And here I am playing it and halfway yeah. through it. I went, why did I, what was I thinking to start playing this? The dude actually wrote it. And right. now I look like I'm like, I just like, I'm not even in the right space, but the, the good news is I absolutely crushed the lick. And he said that to me afterwards as well. He said, dude, you played it exactly like I do. And I still, you know, uh, 30 years later, I still get up in the morning and think of that. And that's what gets my day. Yeah, started. you have that thought every morning. <laughs> I have that thought every morning. <laughs> oh, my God. Are we still recording? Is this recording right this now? This is recording. <laughs> this is. We should just go live. I'm just going to go live to YouTube right now. We're just going to forget the recording. <laughs> um, well, uh, so Brilliant. let's rewind a little bit, you know, yes. in case there's, you know, for the two or three people that have never heard of you, like you, I mean, you were an early, early, early online campus pastor. Um, yeah. and uh, so you got into ministry, you somehow made your way into doing church online and being part yeah. of that experience and have, yeah. you know, been at the forefront of what that's looked like. And certainly, 2020 and beyond it exploded and every church started trying to figure out church online to some extent. And, you know, you, now you've written a book, you know, meta church yeah. to, to kind of, you know, I don't know, expound on all of that and where church is yeah. going and whatnot. So take us back. Like, how'd you get into ministry and how'd you go from ministry into the church online world? Yeah. So, um, you know, look, uh, going way back and then fast forward and real quick. So way back, I didn't grow up in a Christian home at all. I grew up um, quite the opposite. Um, and so didn't even become a follower of Jesus until I was like a senior in high school. And back then, like I had no interest in ever being in ministry. I, it's not something that was on the cards, didn't want to do it. Um, you know, as a senior in high school, um, starting to go to church for the very first time, I thought it was good and all, but no, I didn't want to be a pastor. That's for, for dang sure. What I wanted to be was a, um, a TV sports reporter. And so, you know, that's what I did at, at college and uh, started making my way up through newspapers, magazines, and eventually ended up on TV in Australia as a sports reporter for one of the three major networks here on a show that was essentially like out our equivalent of ESPN Sports Center, and I did that for seven or eight years okay. before God really called me into ministry. And when when He made that call, you know, I thought I was in my dream job, and and you know, I'm doing everything I want to do. You know, all my friends were envious, all my mates were envious of what I did because I got to cover, you know, Formula One Grand Prix in in, in Melbourne, Australia. I covered the Australian Open tennis, yeah. golf, 
um, you know, I was getting into all these great sporting events and interviewing the top sports athletes in the country. I thought this was my dream job, but then God called me into ministry. And so I turned to the only person who I would have counted as my pastor at the time, which was this guy at a church in New Jersey who I was listening to on podcast. This was, you know, 2007. And I was listening to him on podcast on my way into the studio every day. And I said, I think I'm getting called into ministry. I don't know what that looks like. And the dude offered me a job, flew me out to New Jersey, moved my whole family. And I went into full-time ministry as an online pastor in 2008 in New Jersey, which reference back where Bon Jovi comes from. Part of the reason why I, I thought this was, yes. I thought this was a God thing, not just a good thing. And, and so what I realized at the time though, Frank was looking back, I didn't want to get into ministry, but God was creating opportunities for me to get experience in front of the camera to get experience with production, to get experience with communication. Mm -hmm. And all of those things actually work together to help me become an online pastor at a time when being an online pastor wasn't really a thing. Yeah, 2008 would have been, right? Because Church Online probably only kind of started coming around around then maybe a little earlier than that like early 2000s right was when it kind of started yeah off. sort of i know life church started uh around 2006 2007 and, yeah. and so when i came on there wasn't many of us in fact i know from conversations i had with the people who were the early adopters i was like the the eighth uh full-time online pastor in, in the u.s and, wow. and potentially the world and so it was we'll real world. early days. Goes world. On this podcast, it's eighth in the world. Eighth in the world. Eighth in the world. Um, so yeah, it was really early days. But what I didn't realize was, like I said, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh God, you were like playing 3D chess when I was like, I was playing tic-tac-toe or something because you had had set up all these skills in my life that actually came to the fore when I started being an online pastor. And then fast forward a few more years, I ended up in Atlanta in 2013 as the social media and online pastor for North Point Ministries, where Andy Stanley is the lead pastor. And I ended up doing that for quite a number of years as well. And, and nice. um, yeah, so in this book that I wrote, Meta Church, which uh, is you know, only two weeks old now. Um, what I did was I wanted to create a, a, a book that was really super practical in, in application. And so, so I have literally dropped out everything uh, that I've learned about online ministry over the years and the strategies and systems that I've learned and, and have really just put all of it into one book. That, that's literally what the book is about. There's three, um, there's three sort of sections. The first section is the philosophical argument around online church and the theological argument around online church. Then it gets into the practical side. Here's the strategies. Um, now, I tried not to make it necessarily channel specific with here's how you do reels because you know a year from now, reels aren't going to be a thing and, and the algorithm will have changed. And so I wanted to just really apply the the ministry strategies a lot of which i picked up from andy and, and the team at north point and apply that to a digital uh, setting so that anybody who reads this can apply the this online strategy to whichever context they're in whether it's small church large church medium church uh, rural church urban church ministries nonprofits like i wanted to create something that was practical across the board and then yeah. the third section is really about predicting the future what does the future look like and for that honestly anybody listening or watching this buy the book just for chapter 18 because what i did was i grabbed some of the smartest people i know in the church online space everybody from mark batterson right through to some people that you've you know you've had on your podcast trey van camp for example and just ask them what do you think the future of church looks like and there's maybe 30 different people who i just verbatim took what they wrote and put it into a, into the last chapter. And it's by far my favorite chapter because it's the one where you learn from all the people who are on the bleeding edge right. of what the church can and should be doing from a digital point of view. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, people should check it out. Like, you know, 2020 and beyond, everybody had to go kind of to church online. And now yeah. people are, people are maybe this kind of gray fuzzy world of, you know, what, what should I do and what should it look like and all that. Yeah. But let maybe let's touch on the, the kind of, theological side of it for a minute right yeah, yeah. i i do think that's still a thing you know and i don't know how much of a thing it is i, I don't you know it could be huge it could be small but i yeah. do think people struggle pastors struggle a little bit with like oh do i have church online but isn't church meant to be with people 
And, you know, God didn't, you don't read the book of Acts and get the feeling of being disconnected and online. You get the feeling of <laughs> closeness and family and connection and isn't church online kind of distant. You know, I feel like that's a thing. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've got my views on the whole world and all that, but like, what's your take? How do you help pastors and church leaders through that thinking and, and yeah. how, do, how do they see it or how should they see it? Yeah, it, it, you're right. It is still a thing. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time um, a pastor or a church leader has used uh, Hebrews 10, 25 uh, as, a, as an argument against online ministry, you know, obviously that is the let us not give up meeting together um, aspect. Um, yeah. You know, if I, I wouldn't need to write a book if I had a dollar for every time somebody had done that because it happens over and over and it still happens today. And, and what I've seen even, even since the pandemic, um, you know, when everything started to, wind down from a COVID point of view or seems to still be winding down and churches could open up again all around the world. What I saw a lot of church leaders, basically they adopted this view that that online thing that we did for those two years, that was just a short-term mission trip that we were on. Now we're back to the quote unquote real world and we can go back to doing ministry the way that right. we've always done it. But for my, for my um, perspective, my perspective on it is, yeah, look, Hebrews 10.25 is important. Let us not give up meeting together. But keep in mind that when the author of that, uh, of Hebrews wrote that in the first century, really the only way to meet together was, was in person, right? The only way to do that was to be on site in the same room, in the same place with somebody. But the world has changed dramatically. Frank, you and I are recording this podcast I'm in, I'm in Australia in a completely different day than what you are, right? <laughs> yes. But we're still meeting together and, and, and connecting and, and having the same sort of interaction we might if we were sitting at a table together. Um, it's just a, a, a limited version of that. But the, the interaction, the engagement, the, the relationship is still the same. And so I, what I constantly argue is, yes, we should not give up meeting together. And the important thing there is that as an online pastor, I, myself, and, and I've spoken to... Uh, tens, probably hundreds of online social media pastors in the world. And I've never heard an online pastor say that online should replace offline. Nobody right. ever says that. But what we do believe is that um, uh, online can enhance what's happening on site. Um, whatever the church is doing on a Sunday, we can enhance that by meeting with people during the week via Zoom, via you know Instagram posts, via TikTok, all of those certain all, all of those platforms allow us to interact on a more regular basis. And this is where for me Acts 247 comes in, right? Um, pastors love to talk about Acts 247 because yeah. there's this huge payoff. And every day the Lord added to the number of those who were being right. saved. We all love that. We all want that. We all want God to add daily to the size of our congregation. But Acts 246, we step over that. Acts 2.46 says, um, and they met together every day in houses and in the temple courts. And, and we step over that. We want the payoff of Acts 2.47, but we're not willing to put in the work of Acts 2.46 because we've set up a model of church that is come to us at a certain location, at a certain time zone, um, and we'll meet together for an hour and, and, and we'll teach the bar and then we'll send you off during the week and we say, hey, thanks for coming to church today. See you next week. Mm -hmm. when, when the reality is we're supposed to be meeting together every day. Right. And, and technology, digital online technology allows us to do that. It's really taking Jesus's first century model of discipleship and saying, hey, I met with 12 young men every day for three years and I poured into them and I, I, they saw me in every aspect of my life. But in the modern church world, it seems like we often just want to say, hey, come back next Sunday and then we'll talk about that again. Right. Or discipleship has become a 12-week course that we do uh, you know, once a week for 12 weeks. And we say, well, now you're a disciple. No, we're always a disciple. And we can leverage online technology to literally meet together every single day. And so that's part of my philosophical, my theological outlook of what happens, uh, of why church online is quote unquote valid and why it's something that we should be doing. And that's really what the book is about, Frank. Um, you know, I called it meta church because meta church is a, is a term that I've been leveraging for a lot longer than uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been calling Facebook meta and created the metaverse. Yeah, right, right. It. It's a good connection. That. You must have got really lucky. <laughs> it, it was pure luck. And in fact, the book wasn't even called Meta Church when I started writing it. It was called something else. But but what I realized was I'd been leveraging this term Meta Church for quite a few years back when yeah. you know I was on staff at North Point and talking to Andy Stanley about what and what an the the future approach to church and what our church model should look like. And the reason I use that word Meta Church. Is 
is because the word meta is really just a prefix. And it's a prefix that has multiple meanings. The first meaning is it's to transform or to change, as in the word metamorphosis, you know, when a, a worm becomes a butterfly uh, or, or a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So it means to change or transform, but it also means to go beyond as in the word metaphysical, to go beyond just the physical. So meta means to change, transform, and to go beyond. And really what this book about is about is about encouraging and, and trying to help churches change and transform their model to go beyond Sunday, to go beyond the church building and into their local communities every day of the week so that they can reach more people and change more lives. That's really what the term meta church means for me. Um, a lot of people will use terms like uh, physical or, or, or digital or, um, you know, stuff like oh, hybrid church, yeah. Uh, yeah. those sorts of terms. Meta church is just my version of that. And the reason I don't use physical and digital, which often gets put together in the worst possible way by certain people who call it fidgetal church. The reason... <laughs> One of the it's a there's two reasons, name, right? Like <laughs> there's a t- two reasons I don't like that. Fidgetal sounds like a crime, and we shouldn't be using it anyway. It's the worst word. Second, yeah. f- digital church is still physical. I might be watching online, but I'm still physically present. And it's yeah. the, also the reason why I don't like online versus in person. First of all, it shouldn't all be versus. Like we're all on the same team. And right. even though I might be watching online, I'm still in person, I'm just in person in my lounge room or I'm in person listening on a podcast. So what I talk about is this idea of meta church to change your model and go beyond. And I use terms such as on site or online um, because you can be on site at the church or you can be watching online and they're still in person and I'm still physical. I just might not, might not be on site in the right, church. Right. But also I believe Frank very strongly that there's a day coming and it might be years from now, it might be decades from now, but I know my kids and your kids are probably not going to call it online church and in-person church or physical church and digital church. They're just going to call it church. Right. That's all. It's yeah. just church because that's the way we live our lives in the modern world. And when churches get on board with this and when churches start to realize that, you know, we need to be in people's lives 24 seven and, and seven days a week, not just on Sundays, then right. that's right. when it, all of this, whether they're watching um, by sitting in a pew and looking live at what's going on, or if they're watching on their phone or on their computer or the tablet or through VR goggles, we're just going to call it church at some point because that's really what it is. Well, I, I was talking about this earlier today uh, with Dean, also from Tidely. We were just chatting about this, uh, and I'm like, "Man, my kids like live like kind of live in this dual. We we live in it too. My my kids live in it kind of in a next level way. Your kids yeah. would be similar, right? Like my kids go to school." So, you know, we're up in the morning, family's doing some stuff. We get them ready. They get out the door, they get to school. Yeah. They're, they're physically interacting at school, like, right. Person to person, teachers, friends, all the stuff. And then they come home from school and, you know, they do some homework, do some chores and then they hop on Roblox Yeah. or they hop on Minecraft Yeah. and, and they're interacting with the same kids they were in person with at school. Yeah. Right. Like physically there, however, you know, on site, they were on site in the classroom and then they're at home and they're interacting with their friends online in some virtual world of some sort, right? Roblox has its version. Minecraft's got its version. There's all kinds of other stuff out there. And then, you know, like a couple hours later, they've got basketball practice and they go to basketball practice and they're, you know, they're on site again and they're interacting with friends, you know, yeah. Human, human bodies touching, like they're there yeah, yeah. doing their thing. They come home, we get dinner and then they might hop back online for a minute and they're, you know, in Roblox again, doing something like, so yeah. they live this, but they're connecting with their same friend. Like they're doing stuff online with friends that isn't necessarily school or basketball, but it's still connecting yeah. and they're doing yeah. it a lot. Right. And so those yeah. guys that are 10, 20 years from now, you know, when they're 30, what does church look like for them? Yeah. You know, like that's a really yeah. interesting thing to think about. It's not going to look like it is right now. And like, there's no. still absolutely going to be on site meeting like together, like they did in acts like that version of together, but there's yeah. going to be a whole other universe of connection. That totally. Exists. 
Totally. And it's interesting to me, you know, we, we've talked about acts a couple of times. When you look at acts, the people met together in their homes. They didn't meet together in, in the temple. If they right. went to the temple, it wasn't inside the temple. They like the scriptures talk about them sitting outside the temples. So people scripture talks about them being, um, you know, the authors of, of the new Testament talked to them about being in homes with each other and they're yeah. still connected as gathering. But what I, what you just explained to me, you know, my, my daughters are exactly the same, right? Your boys, my daughters uh, are digital natives. This is the space they've always grown up with. So they don't see it as any different this is just no i'm talking to my friend mm-hmm. but they're talking with their thumbs you you, you know what i mean but that's yeah. with that's an the, avatar the, right with like an that's avatar the, that's like kind of the next level thing that maybe you and i didn't necessarily we've done it but we didn't grow up doing it whereas Correct. now like they literally are that's a thing like yeah they have an and avatar that they're styling and doing stuff with and And dude, your sons and my daughters hopefully will be the church leaders of the future. And they're going to come at it with a different perspective than a couple of 40 or 50 year old guys. They're going to come at it with this. Well, I grew up with this technology and it's just natural and normal to me, which ironically, what you just explained to me as you're explaining, I'm like, yeah, what you just explained, dude, is what the apostle Paul did, right? He would go into a town and he would start a church, but then he would go back and live hundreds of miles away, but he stayed connected by using the technology of his day yeah. to continue to disciple and teach them. You know, the technology right. of his day was letter writing. Yeah, the yeah. pen and paper, right? That was The pen and paper was his technology and he yeah. used it to stay connected with the people who he was discipling. Yet, gosh, if, if Paul took up the same a model of church that most modern day church leaders have, which is discipleship only happens when people are physically in front of me, physically in a room, uh, making that happen, then at least 13 books of the New Testament would not have been written because he was writing letters using the technology of his day to, mm. to disciple people. We, right. The church needs to be, the church needs to readopt this innovative spirit that Paul had to leverage technology for the gospel. This is what I believe. And and we don't need to do that because of COVID in the world. We need to do that because of indifference in the world. People aren't coming to church because they're indifferent to church. All All the technology, sorry, all the analytics and statistics and data from people like Bonner and McCrindle here in Australia tells us that church attendance was declining long before the pandemic hit. It was in in free fall, or it was at least you know going down into the to the right. That was before the pandemic hit. Um, even people who attended church had stopped attending church on a weekly basis. They were attending once every three weeks, then it became once every five weeks in 20, yeah. 2019, long before the pandemic hit. But back then, in those days, when when physical attendance was declining, especially weekly physical attendance was declining, what I noticed as an online pastor at North Point, was that more people than ever were connecting with our church via podcasts. More people than ever were listening or watching a message that was live streamed. More people than ever were were leveraging YouTube to access our content. Like that was going up and to the right when attendance was going down and to the right. Um, And so, you know, in that way, I remember talking with Andy about this in like 2017, 2018, that church attendance is not decreasing it's decentralizing Mm -hmm. people are still accessing our church content and they're finding other ways to create community around that content so we might have somebody who shows up the first sunday of the month but the second you know to a physical on-site service but then the second sunday of the month they listen on a podcast on their commute to work the third sunday of the month they might be away so they watch the live stream the sunday after that they might um you know watch video on demand because they had sporting events or something on sundays um and then you know, beyond that, uh, the content that we put on YouTube is evergreen and can, and can be seen by people days, weeks, months, years later. That doesn't make that less valid. But what we need to do as church leaders is to start to leverage the reality of the world and start finding ways to create calls to action for every piece of content that we put out that leads people into physical community. I remember when I was the online pastor at North Point, one of the shifts in language that I introduced when we were hosting the services live and we would, we, we didn't pre-record anything. We did all of our hosting spots live while the band was setting up behind us. Yeah. And the, and the, the, the messaging that I put in to, to change things was I would always have our hosts, whether it was me or somebody else say, we stream these services 
to give you a window into our church, but also to create a doorway into community. And the best way to get community is to visit one of our Atlanta area churches. Yeah. Now that languaging was was the opening steps of this meta church approach to to leverage um, online to impact on-site attendance. And we wanted people to get into that community. But it also was another key thing in there was we felt that as a as a church, we were not broadcasting our services to the entire world. I mean, we were to a certain extent, but more more specific than that, and more strategic than that, we were narrow casting our services to people who lived within driving distance of our church buildings in Atlanta. Right. And so that shift to, meant that for us at North Point, content wasn't king online; context was king online. And so we wanted to speak into the context of the audience that we felt specifically called to reach. And this is where this impacts church leaders all over the world. We all think that we need to be highly produced content, like lights, cameras, the whole deal. We have to pull all these resources into that because we're broadcasting to the world. I keep saying, no, you're not. You're narrow casting to the people who live in the community that God has uniquely called you to serve in, mm-hmm. whether that's Atlanta or whether that's rural Pennsylvania or in the, in the desert in Central Australia. God has called you to serve in that community. So leverage online technology to speak to the context of the community where God has called you to serve. That is the most important and most innovative thing I think yeah. churches can do when it comes to the online space. What Maybe like practically, because um, you got the big churches, you get the big, whether they're mega churches or however you define it, right? You get these churches that are big, have resources, staff, money, gear, all the stuff. Um, but most churches aren't that, right? Most yeah. churches around the world are, you know, a hundred people, 200 people, right? They're yeah. smaller. That's, that's yeah. their life. So how do you think, you know, the, the concepts in meta church, like apply to them and what, what can they do like today? Like not, yeah. not because they're all online because of COVID, but like now we're, you know, we're on the other side of it, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how's the hundred member church supposed to look and do things when they're meeting in person and trying to do this online stuff too? Great question. So w- what I would say is this, one, one of the most innovative things that a lot of churches could do is to stop streaming their services on Sunday. We f- we all feel like we have to do that in yeah. order to quote unquote be online. Well, we, we, if we stream, we're online. But really, like, like camera I, in the back, that's literally just showing the whole. Yeah, kind of experience, I would say you know. it would be innovative for some churches to stop doing that. Uh, I think during the pandemic, what we found was that live stream became mainstream. Everybody started doing it and everybody felt like they had to do it. Yeah. And so now people are making that <clears throat> A decision, am I going to continue to do it? For, for some churches that are smaller, I would say, hey, why don't you stop doing that? And the resources that you're putting into that, whether it was financial, um, you know, through purchasing of cameras and things like that, or if it's people through having uh, staff or volunteers who are running that side of things, why don't you stop doing that on a Sunday and instead create content that's actually going to be helpful to the community that you've been called to serve during the week? Um, one of the things, yeah. I, this is not in the book um, and it's not in the book because it's something I think during the writing process, I was just experimenting with, but I've seen it have such great impact lately has been to start asking questions in your local community about what are the questions people are asking about faith, Jesus, God, church, the Bible in your local community. Mm. If you do a search for the, I don't know, let, let's go with the top 50 questions that people in your community are asking when it comes to the topic of faith, if you were to find out what they were and provide short two to four minute answers to each one of those questions, you've got content that is relevant to the people in your community because you're finding out what they're actually asking. Too often, too many churches, Frank, in my opinion, too many churches are answering questions no one is asking. And it's time that the smaller churches one of the things you could do is figure out what are those 50 questions, create video content around that and put that out onto YouTube, put that out onto social media and see what it does with calls to action to connect. If you've got more questions, maybe to an alpha group or or a starting point group or one of these uh, groups that people can ask questions about faith in and start being in community and, and answering the questions that are most relevant to the people in your community. If you were to do that, 
if the average church of 100 was to do that and find those top 50 questions, that's a whole year of preaching content as well. Because yeah. you add <laughs> you add Easter and Christmas in there, there's 52 weeks of the year covered. Right. And it's answering questions that people are actually asking your local community. Well, as I've done this- And for then the call churches, to action can be like, if you just did it, it could be like, hey, this week's series is on this or this month's series is like- Or this you know, year we're answering yeah. questions the most asked questions in my, in our city about faith. Like that's a, that's a, that's a great piece of content. I think now, as I've started to do this with some churches in Pennsylvania, some churches in, um, in Detroit, uh, some churches, some churches here in Australia, and even some ministries like uh, compassion as an alpha Australia, as I've started to do these things, what I've realized is the questions that people ask around faith, Jesus, God, the Bible church, a way different state to state, country to country. Hmm. And so it's very specific around certain things and certain ideas that are relevant to to what the average family is facing. You know, I, I worked, my team here worked with a church in a place called Rockhampton, Queensland, which is you know, um, a smallish sort of town, um, you know, maybe a hundred thousand people live in the whole region. And the, one of the first things we asked is what is the biggest issue in the community? Like, what is the biggest issue that the community is facing? And the pastor said, well, um, children being impacted by domestic violence is a really big issue in Rockhampton. Wow. And I said, oh my gosh, like, so what is the church doing to help answer some of the questions people have around that? Well, nothing yet. And I was like, there is a great opportunity right there to be relevant in the local community by creating content that answers the questions people are actually asking. But unfortunately in church world, Frank, I feel like we have redefined the word relevant. We think relevance is moving lights and smoke machines and skinny jeans, right? That's what we deem as being relevant. But relevance is meeting the needs of somebody when they need it most, right? So if I'm stranded in the desert, or if I'm stuck out at sea, say, say I fell off a boat and I'm stuck out at sea and I've been treading water for two days. And then you arrive in a boat and pull me out and give me a glass, you know, a bottle of water. I'm not worried about what sort of boat you came in. I'm not worried yeah. about what brand of water you gave me. I'm just thankful because you are the most relevant person in my life because you met the need, the yeah. biggest need that I had in the moment that I needed it the most. So, yeah. so yeah. church leaders, especially church leaders of churches that are 100 or 200 or less. Start answering the questions that people in your community are asking, and you will become the most relevant people to them. And you might find that some of them want to step into community if you're open to answering more questions that they have around faith, church, Jesus, God, the Bible. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. That's killer. Well, I don't want to go too long. Um, I know it's early. You probably have a whole crazy packed day. Um, (laughs) So people need to go check out the book. Just, yes, they can probably just do a Google search or a Bing search or a whatever search for. Wait, Meta wait, Church. wait! People, people use Bing. I, oh I mean, gosh. I've heard people using DuckDuckGo. Isn't that another Duck, browser? Duck Go is another one. There, I mean, <laughs> yes. Whatever uh, search you funny. use, just it's, search for Meta Church. Yes, the easiest way to do it is to to do that, or you can go to Amazon and just search for Dave Adamson or Meta Church, or go to metachurchbook.com and you'll have there you're going to find not only uh, a link to where you can buy the book, but also some information and some videos about the book. But also I'm dropping in there, um, you know, graphics that I use throughout the book so that you like literally I, I've laid out an entire church strategy around digital ministry from everything from podcast and you version yeah. to, you know, uh, giving apps like Tithely to church online platforms to all the social media platforms Listen. and even how to process what the new media coming out is, you know, whether that's what's the next TikTok, what's the next Discord, um, things like that. So yeah. it's all laid out there. I love that. And I'll double check to make sure Tithely is the first one. If it's not, I don't, I don't know what's, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know what I'm going to do, but you know, we'll leave that. Hey, for, you know, what's uh, interesting. You know what's interesting? I do mention Tidely in the book in a couple of places, but you know what's interesting to me, man, is that, um, you know, people will say Hebrews 10, 25, people have to come to physical church or on-site church because that's what the Bible says. Yet Malachi also talks about, you know, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So 
you know, if you apply the same logic, churches should only accept money that's given on site in cash form. And isn't that, that Old Testament? With them. Isn't that Old Testament? Wasn't that oh. like crops and? Well, now you know, we're opening I mean, up a whole yeah, new bag. <laughs> this is a whole backwards. new episode. But isn't it interesting that when it came to uh, leveraging technology to receive finances, the church was able to quickly adopt it and quickly shift their theology around yeah. it. Yeah, Yet yeah, when yeah. it comes to in person, we or on site, we have this weird thing. And, and, and I think part of it, if I can be super candid with you, and I'm guilty of this, right? I'm guilty of this when I preach. I'm guilty of this when I play guitar at North Point, for example, because someone uh, I used to be on the worship team there. We measure our self-worth and our self-esteem by how many people are sitting in front of us, yeah, listening to us absolutely. or watching us when we do whatever it is we're doing on stage. Right. And we spiritualize that by using Hebrews 10, 25. But for me, this is a Mark 16, 15 issue, which says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. And in all the world, you know this because you're a dad to three 10 year old boys. This is their world. This oh, okay. cell phone is their world. Their they want one of those things too. They want an world. actual cell phone. And I'm like, no, not until you're 28. I'm just waiting. <laughs> 28. <laughs> wow. But I bet they have access to a tablet, right? They do. Yes, they do. But going into all the world means going onto YouTube. It means going into TikTok yeah. and Discord and, and Twitch and you name that platform. That's what I, I believe that, that um, you know, I believe that when Jesus said that, you know, him being God probably foresaw that that would be part of it. And, you know, right. after an extensive re, uh, researching the extensively researching the Hebrew and the Greek term for go in that sentence, go into all the world, um, it actually means to go. It's a verb. It's, and it's actually a, it's actually a passive verb because the implication is as you are going, not that you've stopped and now you need to go. It's as you're going, because you're already going into right. the world. You're already on social media. You're already watching YouTube. You're yeah. already on Twitch. You're already playing the games on, on, on whatever platform you're playing, Fortnite or, or, or Minecraft. As you're doing that, preach the gospel. Yeah. So we're supposed to be leveraging this anyway. That would be another part of my theology yeah. around all of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. We could sit here and talk all day because I'm, I'm into it. Hopefully people find it really interesting and go read the book, whether you agree or disagree. I think people should go read it to kind of just learn and keep, keep trying to figure this stuff out. Cause it's yeah. only going to get more and more over the exactly. years, right? Like our kids, 20 years, it's going to look different. And um, exactly. there's just have to evolve. So I have three quick questions. Uh, yeah, and then I've got a question for you. Oh, well, shoot. I mean, that just throws me off completely. So let me ask you mine real quick. Okay. So what's a book that you've been most influenced by that people got to go read? Super easy. Uh, the book is called Originals by Adam Grant. Um, and it okay. talks all about... Um, Andy Stanley actually had Adam Grant on his podcast recently. Uh, but Originals talks about um, the idea of what we consider creative is not actually creative. Mm -hmm. Creativity exists in being original. So that book, I read it, I literally read it every year because it it, may, it reminds me to be innovative in my thinking right. and to start leveraging new ways to use the technology that we have. Originals by Adam Grant. Okay, noted. That one's good. What's a podcast that you're listening to right now? Well, I need to say this one, don't I? Isn't that <laughs> no, no, isn't no? You you can't say your book and you can't say this podcast. You got to give <laughs> okay. us something else. Um, so this is decidedly unspiritual but <laughs> the the podcast that i listen to every single week is one called smartless um it's um it's like three smartless like smart less l-e-s-s -S. okay Got all it. one word smart less now it's uh jason bateman and a few other uh, two of his friends i can't think of their name off the top of my head right now will arnett is the other guy um what they do is they're three friends who just bring in guests and one of them knows who it is but the other two don't and then okay. they have this uh it's it's hilarious i love it yeah that's amazing that sounds great look i <laughs> I kind of want people, that question is to actually get people to tell me like something not spiritual. Cause like, we're so spiritual on this podcast. I need a little, like, you know, what else is well, the, in your life? That so. is my breakaway when I just want to just laugh. Um, yeah. that's my, that's my go-to. Cause I, I literally laugh the entire time. So if somebody needs a break and they need to laugh, listen to smartless. You're that guy in the car or on the train or whatever, just cracking up all by yourself it's exactly the I love it is that. literally what i do <laughs> i love that well we already got the third one people just need to go 
to metachurchbook.com. That was my third yeah. question. They need to go all, there. Follow me on all, at Aussie Dave on just about every platform there is. All, all, you're everywhere. Aussie I'm, Dave. You know, USSA. I'm mostly on the IG, so I, I catch all your stuff there, but. Well, I'm glad. Now I've got a question for you. Okay, shoot. Like this is for the people, I don't know what your the ratio is of people who listen to this podcast or who watch it on YouTube. Yep. But if you're listening to this podcast, I want you to go to YouTube and watch this episode because this is my question. Behind you, it looks like you have a shield that is a tightly shield. Is that right? Is that oh, a this. shield? This it looks right. like it's something from the movie Gladiator. Yeah, this is... Uh... Okay, it looked a lot bigger. <laughs> So yeah, it, way back there, it's big, but it's actually like, you know, like the size oh, of my hand, right? They're light globes. So these light up. So at one point, you'd see it in like old, old episodes if you're watching on YouTube, but yeah, this is, this is our original logo. So our logo is kind of a little different today. It's mainly just like the leaf, but this is like the cell phone growing, yeah. right? So at one point, I had this custom made. I found some people on Etsy. And, but I had a whole like sign. So the sign said grow. Yeah. And then this was like almost like a period next to like the big letters. And it was all up on the wall and it lit up. So it it plugs in. Yeah. (laughs) And you know, it's pretty cool, but there's no plug back here. So I can't plug it in. Well, I'm going to start up. If you need some money to get an extension cable or something, (laughs) so you can plug that in, I'm happy to Venmo you or WhatsApp you. (laughs) All right. All right. Done. (laughs) <laughs> whatever you need see we Bet, we change our thinking is. when it comes to finances and online i mean you got the cool lighting back there i don't have that totally worked out yet but you know yeah i would and look look that's awkward there's the book right there yeah i know it's too far back though we got to get that a little closer into the foreground i'm so we- deliberately leaving it way back <laughs> well dave this has been awesome man thanks for the time yeah, and man. uh for folks listening or watching we definitely have more listeners than watchers but all the listeners should go watch on youtube because it's kind of fun to like see the guests in person and kind of see the interaction i agree Um, but uh we appreciate you guys dave thank you for sharing about the book and sharing some of your time go get some coffee have a good breakfast (laughs) and uh you know we'll see everybody next week on another episode of modern church leader thanks guys (laughs) 